It's a great privilege to be here this morning to speak to faculty and students and friends. I'm somewhat um, embarrassed by the introduction because a long time ago a good friend of mine pointed out that when someone important is introduced they say very little about him. And so the longer they speak about you, the less important you are. So I'm grateful for being reminded of that fact this morning. I don't know when children begin to remember, but I do know that my earliest childhood memories are an important part of who I am, though I don't have a good memory for things that I really should remember, things like things that happened to me, people's names, important events. For example, as the President mentioned, I was 14 when I was baptized. But I don't remember many details of what happened. I do remember vividly some things surrounding my conversion, however. Perhaps it's true that you don't remember what doesn't matter to you or what is painful, but I don't think that's true. I remember re relatively little about my childhood, but I do know that it was a happy one. I don't remember many details of when Janice and my sons and I lived in Pennsylvania and I went to graduate school. But that was one of the most important and happiest times of my life. In spite of my poor memory, some memories stand out for me. One of my earliest is a game that my mother and I played together. She chewed gum and blew a large bubble as she could, and I tried to break, the, break that bubble before she could suck it back into her mouth. I also remember the interior of my grandfather's car. It was dark. It was warm. I, for, for some reason, particularly remember the seat covering. Gray, rough, musty, but pleasant smelling. I don't know if it was made of horsehair or wool. But once in a while, as I find myself in a car show, showroom or in a dry goods store, I find myself sniffing, trying to find out what is that smell? What is it that I'm smelling? And I'm usually unsuccessful. I remember riding in the back of the car with my mother, my grandfather, driving while she pointed at the telephone poles going by outside. I think she was counting them and we pointed to the animals in the fields and she would say, look a horse or see the cow. These two shadows of memory come together quite vividly. While my father served in General MacArthur's Honor Guard in, Korea, in Japan during the Korean War, my mother and I lived with and then sometimes near my grandparents in central Missouri. I remember riding with my mother one afternoon, probably in the fall. We were in the back seat. She was on the right and I was in the middle. My grandfather was in the front driving. Mother blew an especially large bubble this time, and this time I won. I burst the bubble before she could pull it back. When it burst, it was all over her face and all over her hair, and she laughed. But Grandpa didn't laugh. I think he was afraid we were going to get gum on the upholstery of his car. I also remember my first experience with death, though at the time I didn't know that's what it was. The house where my grandparents lived when I was young is gone now. It was torn down after their death because it was dilapidated. It was dilapidated. I'm told that the large room on the northwest corner at the front of the house was the bedroom for my mother and me when we came back from Colorado after my father left for Japan. But it wasn't until many years later that I remember being allowed into that room. It was a sitting room. In the early days, its large double row doors were kept quite closed, and I had to be quiet whenever I was near them. At that time, my Aunt Betty, Uncle Ehrman's first wife, slept in the room behind those doors. She was confined there with tuberculosis, which I learned only much later. I don't remember anything about Aunt Betty except being kept from her, but I do remember standing in the front yard one day. We were, I was north of the yard gate, I was across from where the chicken coop was later built, and I watched my Uncle Ehrman carry a small woman wrapped in a light-colored blanket or quilt out to the car, her head on his right shoulder. My mother and grandmother stood watching from the porch. My grandfather got in the front seat to drive. The memory ends there, but my mother says this must have happened when I was about two, perhaps on a visit, since by the time we returned to Missouri to wait for my father, my aunt was dead. I also remember well the first time my father talked to me about baptism. This was several years before we joined the LDS Church. I was in the fourth or fifth grade, and we lived in Munich, Germany. One day, I suppose it was a Saturday or a Sunday, my father took me for a walk. We crossed the highway, now a freeway, west of our apartment building, and we walked along the forest paths with others who were out for a stroll. The sky was clear and bright, and the green and black of the Perlacher Forest contrasted beautifully with the light of the sky. 
My father talked to me about whether I wanted to be baptized, and I agreed. I only vaguely remember being baptized by the Protestant chaplain, but I remember well the event of that conversation. In a certain way, that walk in the Bavarian woods, talking with my father about serious things, has come to define my experience of Germany. Such memories have played a large part in shaping who I am. For philosophical reasons, I don't believe in what many refer to as the unconscious. I can't make sense of it. Nevertheless, it's obvious that there is much about myself that I cannot bring to explicit consciousness. Memories such as those I've mentioned are tips of icebergs floating in my consciousness. They indicate places where matters of considerable weight can be found, even if I cannot explicitly name or bring them to consciousness. They reveal not by exposure, but by suggestion. Today I would like to speak with you about memory, partly because it is a professional interest of mine, but also because it is so central to the gospel that we covenant to remember every time we take the bread and water of the sacrament. Philosophers have had a great, great deal to say about memory. Reading and teaching philosophy, I have learned to distinguish between recollection and memory, the former being a psychological phenomenon that is a subset of the latter. Memory includes the things I can recollect, but it's not limited to it. At this point, many of you are going to ask, what in the world can he be talking about? What could memory be except a subjective psychological phenomenon, what I call to mind? I know you're asking that because my children are always asking that. But to think about an answer to that question, consider an example. Like most married people in our culture, I wear a wedding band, and it cannot be reduced to its economic value as a piece of gold or even to its instrumental value. And that is because, beyond having economic or instrumental values, my wedding band is a symbol of my marriage. It is obviously as a symbol connected to memory. On the other hand, though it serves to remind me that I'm married, it's more than just a reminder. But what more could it be? First notice that if my wedding band were only something for reminding me, then I could also have chosen to tie a string, a string to my finger. However, I can't, though I can create such reminders, putting a post-it note on my computer monitor or remarks in my daily planner, a wedding ring works differently than such things work. It is more than a reminder, because at least, at least because my wife Janice gave it to me. It's different from a reminder because it has a physical relation to her, and so mediates my physical relation to her. However, when I wear the ring, it isn't that just by doing so I touch Janice in absentia. The ring is not a substitute for my wife. It can remind me. It can cause me explicitly to think about my marriage. However, most of the time I wear it without explicitly thinking of my wife or my marriage. Nevertheless, it continues to do its work. And I notice that it does that work quickly if I take it off to work and forget to put it back on. I am more conscious of my wedding ring's presence, of, of its absence rather, than its presence. So I cannot explain what it does by the way in which it is sometimes explicitly present to thought. Thus my wedding ring is a memorial of our relation because it does something for me in spite of myself. Even if I am not thinking of my marriage, the ring demands a certain attitude toward the world, a certain reverence and respect for my wife. It connects me to Janice even when I am not explicitly thinking of her. My wedding ring makes possible certain relations in the world by embodying those relations. Said another way, my wedding ring gives an order to the world, an order that relates me to my wife and to the rest of the world, an order that cannot be reduced just to my intentions to remember or recall. Thus, though it is an odd thing to say, it is as if my wedding ring remembers my marriage for me. Not only does the ring not usually refer to or represent Janice explicitly, it doesn't take her place there is a very real sense in which it takes my place rather than hers. Perhaps like all symbols, rather than merely reminding me, my wedding ring remembers for me, and that is how it can also serve as an explicit reminder. We encounter the same phenomenon in many other things, things other than wedding rings, for example, in physical symbols, in sacred objects, in ritual practices, in a variety of institutions. I've already mentioned the sacrament. Perhaps the most important event, uh, symbol in Latter-day Saint experience. We see the phenomenon in other more mundane places as well. The university is an institutional repository of memory. As an institution, it remembers a great deal for us, making our explicit recollection of many things possible, 
giving our lives a particular character, creating possibilities for us that we have not yet discovered, sometimes that we have not envisioned. The university is a memorializing object and institution, not only in such things as the library collections, which are obvious and important, but also in such things as its organization and influence, in its, the academic regalia we wear at graduation, and other traditions, whether we recognize them, them or not, in our folklore, in our style of gossip, in the courses that we teach, such as our civilization and our history uh, courses and our American heritage courses. We often see the university as a place from which we look to the future, a place where we prepare for jobs, where we produce knowledge that will have effects in the lives of others. But it is equally important to recognize that as an institution, the university is a place of remembrance, a place of memorial. In fact, I suspect that a university can be oriented toward the future only because it is an institution of memory. As a Latter-day Saint institution, BYU is the repository for a particularly important memory, the memory of the restoration, the restoration as it enlightens the academy. And that memory orients us to the world and to the future in a unique way. At the personal level, memory resides not only in my subjective recollections, but also in things I may seldom notice, such as the ways I speak, ways that may betray my origins, as when I say Missouri rather than Missouri. More broadly, that I speak English rather than Korean or Swahili or Romanian as my native language is a memory of my cultural inheritance. The ways that I interact with others are memories of the interactions that I've had in my family, in my childhood. They are also the memories of accumulated results of countless human interactions in the past. When I joined the church, such things as our pioneer heritage became part of my memory, as did a uniquely Latter-day Saint vocabulary and various social practices. Most importantly, by joining the church, the memory of the prophets became part of me, as did the atonement. I was raised a Bible-believing, uh, Bible-reading Christian. But through my conversion, a vast storehouse of memory was added to my belief an important part of which is Latter-day Revelation. While studying the scriptures a few years ago, I was impressed by the importance of memory when I read a passage from the Book of Mormon. At the end of 1 Nephi 1, the prophet tells us that he will abridge the sacred record of his father and that he will give an account of his own life. He then tells us that Lehi prophesied to the people of Jerusalem, but they refused to listen. Instead, they mocked him and sought to kill him. Then having set the context and the mood of his message, Nephi says, I will show unto you that the tender mercies of the Lord are, all, are over all of those whom he hath chosen, because of their faith, to make them mighty even under the power of deliverance. As I read that sentence, it struck me that we might take this to be Nephi's thesis, his thesis for the Book of Mormon. Nephi and the other Book of Mormon prophets give us to remember the tender mercies of the Lord that, so that we can be delivered according to our faith. As I reread the Book of Mormon with Nephi's statement in mind, I was struck by how often the prophets begin by calling us to remember the mercy of the Lord. However, given that the Book of Mormon ends with the annihilation of the people of Mormon and Moroni, we may find this thesis startling. How does a record that ends in disaster and genocide show us the tender mercy of the Lord? Moroni's answer is clear. By showing us that the Lord has over and over again been merciful to his children, the Book of Mormon, like the Bible, gives us hope. Hope even when we are in what would otherwise seem a hopeless situation. In Moroni 10.1, Moroni begins his final exhortations. To the remnant of the Lamanites, he says, Behold, I would exhort you that when ye shall read these things, if it be wisdom in God that ye should read them, that you would remember how merciful the Lord hath been to the children of men from the creation of Adam even down unto the time that ye shall receive these things, and ponder it in your hearts. And he follows this exhortation to remembrance with an exhortation that those who receive the Book of Mormon should ask the Father whether it is true. In other words, they should ask the Father about the truthfulness of the record of God's mercies in the Book of Mormon. In verse 24, Moroni turns from the descendants of Lehi to the descendants of the rest of us, exhorting us, too, to remember the things we have read, namely, the account of God's tender mercies to his people, tender mercies that make them mighty even unto deliverance and faith. As do the psalmists, Nephi and Moroni see a close connection, perhaps even an identity, between remembering the tender mercies of the Lord and repentance. Without such memory, we are unable to repent. If we repent, remembering those tender mercies is always part of our repentance. 
Over and over again, we find this theme in the Book of Mormon. Conversion and reconversion come by remembering. Dedication, sacrifice, and covenant are one with memory. Sermon after sermon begins with a prophet reminding his listeners or readers of what the Lord has already done for them. They remind us of the flood, of the exodus from Egypt, of their journey across the ocean. Ammon converts Leomoni by rehearsing to him the stories of Scripture, beginning with the story of Adam and Eve and continuing to his own time. Once I noticed this theme of remembering God's mercy, I saw it everywhere. The Lord announces himself to Moses by calling himself the God of Abraham, the God of Isaac, and the God of Jacob, a common appellation and a name that reminds us of the mercies that he showed to Abraham, Isaac, and Jacob, mercies especially manifest in his covenant with them. Occasions for memory are found not only in Scripture. Each Sunday, as I suggested already, we renew our covenant with the Father by taking tokens of Christ's body and blood in remembrance of that flesh and blood, and by promising always to remember Him. I understand the word of wisdom as an ongoing memorial of who, what we are and what we have promised. One of the most obvious sites of memory is the garment won by those who are endowed, reminding us of the covenants we have made. We wear sacred memory on our bodies day in and day out. Like the wedding ring, the garment remembers for me, calling me to recollection when need be, but ordering my life and my world even when I do not have it explicitly in consciousness. Because I wear the garment, I am in the world differently than I would be if I were not. In my own life, the memorializing practices and practices, objects and practices of the Church continue to make my spiritual life possible. When I remember the Savior, not only in my recollections, but especially in the way that I live with others, in the way things that I do to keep the commandments, I bear witness of his saving relation to me, and as promised in the sacrament prayers, I receive the Spirit. To the degree that I do not have memory from the readily identifiable and seemingly mundane culture that Latter-day Saints seem to share all over the world, to my obedience to commandments even when I am not thinking of them, to the mysteries and blessings of the temple, I am not part of the body of Christ. I am not one of his adopted sons. Sometimes I find myself slipping from the memory into which I have entered through my conversion. I have sometimes doubts about my testimony. Something happens that I do not understand, and I wonder whether the Church is true. Or I may chafe at the commandments or at some policy. I might think myself better than others, sometimes because of education, sometimes because of social status, often who, for who knows what reason. I may criticize instructors and leaders in church, wishing not out loud and rarely even to myself, but wishing it none, nonetheless that they had more training in the ministry, that they were better at getting my interest, shifting the burden of my spiritual life to them. Occasionally I find myself bored with sacrament talks or quietly and self-deceptively scornful of the testimonies I hear in fa on Fast Sunday. I may be able to recall my covenants at those times. Sometimes I find myself no longer remembering them, no longer remembering my covenants, even if I can recollect them, no longer remembering that at baptism I promised to mourn with those that mourn, yea, and comfort those that stand in need of comfort, so that I could stand as a witness of God at all times and in all things and in all places. In spite of having so promised by baptism, sometimes I do not even learn with those who would learn or testify with those who would testify, much less mourn or comfort. At those times, whatever I may recall, whatever I may repeat consciously, I have no, begun no longer to remember the tender mercies of the Lord. I have begun to slip out of repentance. Now, I hope that my sharing this will, in, in my sharing this, you will recognize a version of yourselves, not because I hope you share my failings, but because I assume that I'm not the only one who has those failings. These events are not what characterizes most of my life in the Church. But they happen often enough that I must consider how to deal with them. And my answer is recollection. Though, recollection cannot be, though memory cannot be reduced to recollection, when I begin to fade and falter, the answer is to explicitly recollect a few events in my life that have brought sharply to my attention what my living my life memorializes. Recollecting the visible tips of the largely invisible icebergs of memory helps resituate me, bringing me back to who I am putting me back into a larger context of memory. So let me finish today by sharing with you a few of my recollections. I share them with some trepidation. 
Sacred experiences are not to be shared easily like political slogans or loose change. One should be careful about sharing them, for sharing them under, uh, too often or under inappropriate circumstances strips them of their sacred character. They become commonplace rather than sacred. In spite of that, there are times when we can share sacred recollections with each other to strengthen the testimonies of both those who testify and those who hear the testimony. And I pray that today is such an occasion. The first experience I would like to share is that of my conversion. My father met the missionaries through a friend at work, Robert Clark. I met them through my parents when my mother cajoled me into taking part in a cottage meeting at our house. I began reluctantly, but once I began, I started listening, and I was hooked. I enjoyed the missionary discussions. I liked the missionaries. I enjoyed learning what they taught. To be honest, however, I didn't read the Book of Mormon. I didn't pray about the Church very much. However, after several months of discussion, with the rest of my family, I wanted to join the Church. We had never attended an LDS meeting, so the missionaries arranged for us to attend the next Sunday so we could at least have been to church once before we were baptized on that first Saturday in February 1962. Sitting on the left side of the chapel, watching the meeting begin, I was not particularly impressed. It looked very much like the Protestant services I was accustomed to, except there were more people on the stand. The table for communion, what Latter-day Saints call the sacrament, was in, to the right of the room rather than in the middle. And uh, those to say the prayers of the sacramental elements were surprisingly young. And the meeting was almost shockingly informal and unpolished. Though I had decided to be baptized, as yet I remained a curious onlooker and not a convert. As the sacrament was blessed and passed, the bread came to me. In my former church, the Disciples of Christ, we believed that everyone present should take part of the, in the sacramental emblems. And though the missionaries had told my parents that this wasn't the LDS practice, no one had told me. As the bread tray came around, I took a piece and put it in my mouth. As I placed the bread in my mouth, I was overcome by the most spiritual experience I had ever had. Instantly, I knew something of what Paul had experienced on the road to Damascus. Without being especially worthy of it, without having sought it in any way more than super, that was any more than superficial, I had been touched by the Holy Ghost. My entire soul, my body and spirit was electrified and on fire. Now, rather than thinking it would be a good idea to join the church, that LDS theology was interesting and so on, I knew that I had to join the church. I was no longer an interested spectator. I knew that what I had learned from the missionaries and what I would learn later was true. I knew that Joseph Smith was a prophet, as was David O. McKay, the prophet at the time. Though I had as yet read only a passage here and there in the Book of Mormon, I knew it was the Word of God. Though I had believed in Christ all of my life, for the first time, I knew that he, Jesus Christ had died for my sins, and I understood something of what it meant to say that. With that experience, I suppose there was a sense in which I could still choose not to be baptized. But there was a more profound sense in which I no longer had a choice. I knew that my life from that point on would be inextricably bound to the Church of Jesus Christ of Latter-day Saints. I didn't know what that entailed, but I did know it was true. I do not know why I was privileged to have such an experience, and others are not. I cannot explain what happened. I only know that that experience provided an anchor for my soul, something to which I can return in recollection when I do begin to falter something that takes me back to the ordering and the order of the gospel in the Church. This is a recollection that returns my memory to me and returns me to it. It is something for which I am deeply and eternally grateful. That first taste of the sacrament has been the most important spiritual experience of my life because it converted me, changing my life. On the whole, since then, I've lived a relatively mundane life. Though spiritual experiences are common, they are rarely dramatic. I don't regret that. It's important to relearn to see the spiritual and the mundane, to find spirituality even when not emotionally wrought, to recognize that the Spirit usually brings peace and speaks quietly. That is more important than having dramatic experiences, and we must be wary of equating our emotional and spiritual lives. Nevertheless, my first experience with the sacrament was not the only such emotionally powerful experience. Shortly after my family was baptized, my father was assigned to the Korean Military Advisory Group for the South Korean Army. He was allowed to take his family to Korea with him. 
We were privileged to grow up in the church living in Korea, to be taught and guided by such families as the Terrys and the Hogans, to be inspired by wonderful Korean saints like Lee Ho-nam and Kim Cha-bong, now in our faculty. In those days in Korea, we did not have stake or district conferences for people in the armed services. We had servicemen's retreats, occasions when those who could get time could go to Seoul and spend two or three days meeting and sharing testimonies. Elder Gordon B. Hinckley was the visiting general authority for Asia, and he was often able to attend our retreats. So they were a very special occasion for us. One year during late fall or winter, we had a retreat in Seoul and Elder Hinckley attended. As we met in our final meeting, a testimony meeting, many bore their testimonies, including my younger brother. I don't recall what was said in those testimonies, though President Hinckley has such a prodigious memory that he can still tell what my brother said. But I felt the spirit as strongly there as I did when that I first received my testimony. I particularly remember Elder Hinckley bearing his testimony, telling us that the spirit was as strong in that meeting as he'd ever felt, as strong even as he'd felt it in meetings of the Twelve in the Temple. He said there were angels in the room witnessing our testimonies. I knew then that what he said was true. I could see no angels. Tears were streaming down my face so heavily that I couldn't see anything, much less angels. But I knew, I absolutely knew what I had learned with my first experience with the church, with the Spirit. The church is true. The priesthood is real and it is the power of God. I had a feeling that I take to be a premonition of what it means finally to be sanctified. For like the king, people of King Benjamin, for a short time I had no more disposition to do evil but to do good continually. I could not and did not want to separate myself from the church which had made such an experience possible or the gospel in that church, pointing as they do to salvation in Jesus Christ. That experience with the Spirit in the presence of one of the twelve became another anchor for my soul. The Lord has not ceased to give me such anchor. Various events have occurred. As I said, they don't occur regularly, but they occur occasionally. One of the more recent was in August of 1994. My second son, Matthew, was to return from his mission to Porto Alegre, Brazil. He asked that his mother and I meet him and do some traveling, and we couldn't do that. But we compromised, and I went to Porto Alegre to pick him up. Matthew and I stayed in Porto Alegre for a few days and then set out to Sao Paulo for bu by bus. The day we were to leave for Curitiba, we discovered that we would have to wait until late afternoon to catch the bus, but we'd already checked out of our hotel and had done everything that we really could do in Porto Alegre without violating mission rules. Matthew had the idea to take a bus to some point midway between Porto Alegre and Curitiba, spend the day there, and then catch the bus to Curitiba as it came through our stop at midnight. He asked the woman selling tickets to tell us a good place to go. Osario, she said, it's a nice resort town with a beach. I wondered what we would do with a missionary at the beach, but decided to take a chance. We bought our tickets and headed to Osario. When we stopped from the bus in Osario, we were surprised. There were mountains, but no beach. We were obviously inland and quite high. We decided to get some lunch and see what Osario had to offer. If worse came to worse, we could sit in the bus station and read. As we turned the corner of one of the first streets we passed, two boys, one a teenager and the other about 11, came running down the street shouting, Elders! Elders! Matthew talked with them, explaining that the, although I was wearing a white shirt and tie, I was not a missionary, and that we were there to be there for only a few hours. But they were excited anyway, not caring that I wasn't a missionary as long as somebody was. <laughs> we must go to see their mother. The older boy ran off to find her, and the younger boy led us toward her. As we came around another corner, a middle-aged woman came running down the street, tears flowing, also crying, elders, elders. Matthew explained the situation again. He was the only missionary there. We would be there only a short time. But that was irrelevant to her. Her prayers had been answered, she said, and she wanted us to come. Have family home evening with us, please, she asked. We couldn't refuse, so we agreed. We agreed to go to their home early that evening for family home evening. We spent the afternoon wandering in town, buying a few presents for Matthew's sisters, sitting in the park, reading and talking. Then we went to their house. We visited with them. We sang a hymn, or they sang a hymn. I listened. Matthew taught a lesson. We prayed with them. As we were ending, the sister told us that we must visit a young man in town who was inactive. Now, I wasn't sure how you know who's inactive when there's no church in town and no church activity. But she knew, and it turned out she was right. 
We walked across a small town to, the, to a highway where this young man owned a truck stop. He fed us a gigantic, definitely non-vegetarian dinner and talked at length with Matthew. As Matthew later explained, the young man had a dream the night before we came. In the dream, two missionaries came to him and told him that he must return to church. And there we were. He could attend church by hitching rides with truck drivers to a town nearby, but he had stopped doing so. I was thunderstruck. I couldn't believe the faith of these people. I couldn't believe how desperately they hunger for what I take for granted. I could not believe how much the Lord loves them as individuals. I could not believe that he had used our seemingly chance wandering around Brazil to bless a few of his children. As I sat on the bus that night, I had difficulty sleeping, not because the bus was uncomfortable, which it was, but because I was so overcome with a vision of the love that the Father and the Son have for each of us, of the need for missionaries in places like Osario, of the beautiful faith of these people, of my own unworthiness in comparison to theirs, of my ingratitude for the blessings I have received. Those few hours in Rosario, Brazil, gave me a deepened appreciation for the love that God has for his children. It reminded me that his love is not a general love, but a specific love for each specific person. Though what we brought to the saints in Rosario was relatively little, that we could be instruments for bringing it renewed my understanding of the Lord's power to save, to save from difficulty, from oppression, from loneliness, and especially from sin. It made me ashamed of taking for granted the access I have to the church and the temple, to inspired and inspiring leadership and instruction. It showed me why the missionary effort is so important and must expand. For here were a group of 10 or 15 people to whom the church had not yet come, because in spite of the large number of young people who serve missions, there are still not enough missionaries. Like the previous experiences, those few hours in Osadio became another anchor for my soul, something I can recollect as a way to remember the covenants I am part of and the obligations that have come to me. I live in a world that gets its significance from memory. Memory manifests in wedding rings and garments, in sacramental emblems, in ordinances and practices and customs and speech, in speech patterns, in names and literature in universities and libraries and classes. I have learned that I live not on my own breath, but also on that of the Spirit, without which there is at best only recollection and no memory, without which emblems, ordinances, and society are dead and hollow shells. Memory manifest in my speech, our customs and habits, our relations, our ordinances and commandments, transcends and encompasses me, making possible the world I live in by giving it structure. Recollection, calling various things to mind, isn't memory. Nevertheless, recollection can resituate us in our memory. As I recollect, recollect, my experiences with the Spirit, I take my place again in the memory that makes life possible and good, that strengthens and continues my testimony. Most of you have experienced moments of spirituality to which your souls are anchored. Those who have not yet will. Sometimes in answer to prayer, sometimes unbidden. My prayer is that when you face doubt or difficulty, you will recollect your souls by recollecting these, an the recollecting these anchoring experiences. And though I have no authority to offer spiritual promises, based on my experience alone, I promise that if you will so recollect, you will continue not only to recollect, but also to remember the everlasting gospel, the covenants you have made, in the holy name of Jesus Christ, in whose name I speak today, amen.